Now, you know, a sound system, of course, consists of sources and mixers and processes and, and loudspeakers. But I submit to you that actually a sound system is more like this. You've got the input stuff, the microphones and so forth. You've got the control stuff, the mixers and so forth, amplifiers. But the sound system includes the loudspeaker in a room. The room and loudspeaker interface is a very important part of what a sound system is. So we're going to start by looking at the transducers themselves. And of course, here's an example of a transducer. And, and I don't know who in this audience knows what. I mean, that's what's challenging about doing these seminars in, in places where you don't know who's in the audience. So what, you know, if I said, well, what's a transducer? A transducer is simply something that changes energy from one form into another. So here's a device that changes acoustical energy into electrical energy. Yeah, just changes it. Now, how well it does that, how efficiently it does that, how effectively it does that, how transparently it does that is all a question. So I've prepared some examples. Now, these examples were uh, borrowed, I think is the proper word, uh, from the internet. You can find many different uh, sources like this where people have taken many different microphones and recorded a single talker in a controlled environment to let you hear the difference between microphones. Okay? So, we're going to try this um, little experiment, and I hope this uh, is up and running. So, you're going to hear... Um, it's, it's going to be a little weird because the, the, the woman who's talking is going to refer to different letters than I've given it. So when I press A, she's going to say, this is microphone G. Try, try to ignore that, okay? So here's A. This is microphone F. Sounds to the sides and especially to the rear of a mic are largely rejected or at least attenuated. Hypercardioids have an even smaller, more focused pattern. Okay. So try to remember how that sounded. Here's another microphone. This is microphone G. It's important to note that even the most directional mics do not completely reject sound outside of the pickup pattern. Okay, not bad. Here's microphone C. This is a microphone B. Dynamic mics are much more forgiving of rough treatment and do not require external phantom power. Condenser mics break more easily if dropped and require phantom power to operate. Here's microphone D. Okay, this is uh, mic C. All microphones require preamp stage to raise levels approximately 60 dB, but condensers and some other types of mics also require low level current to charge the diaphragm of the mic. Okay. And finally, this is uh, microphone P. Large diaphragm mics are best suited for studio work in controlled environments, where they can be placed on a stand, preferably with a shock mount and a pop filter. Uh, would anybody like to hear any of these over again? No? Okay. Could you hear differences between them? Right. Okay, so one thing that might be interesting to look at is how much these things cost. Did that surprise you? So let's listen again between the most expensive and the, and the most least expensive. This is microphone F. Sounds to the sides and especially to the rear of a mic are largely rejected or at least attenuated. Here's the cheapest. This is microphone G. It's important to note that even the most directional mics do not completely reject sound outside of the pickup pattern. Now, I'm not supposed to talk about brands and it would be inappropriate for me to do that, but I'm sure that you know which one microphone B is. Just saying. And the point of this, now I, I don't know if you, you know, if you're willing to, to go on record answering me this, but you know, when we buy something, there's, everyone has this expectation of value. You know, you know what I mean? So sometimes you go, to a restaurant, for example, and you buy, you, you spend a lot of money for a meal and you walk away and say, man, that was worth every penny. And other times you go to a restaurant and you pay a whole lot of money for a meal and you come out saying, 
that was a waste of money. You, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And it, it's completely subjective, and it, it's hard to, that's what marketing people spend all of their lives trying to figure out, is how do, how do we perceive value? But I wonder if any of you thought the difference between A and B was worth 2,500 American dollars. Maybe some of you did. I'm not sure I do. But remember, remember folks, we're talking about the church. We're talking about every dollar that comes to the church is probably sacrificially given. It is, it is not your money. And if your sound guy says, you know what, we really need to spend a whole lot of money because when I look at our microphone collection, they're all worth about a hundred bucks and I really can't do my job unless I've got two thousand dollar microphones. I think you need to take that with a little bit of um, hesitation. Okay. So what about loudspeakers? What impact do they bring to the experience and to the context of church. Before we go into loudspeakers, I think we need to understand really briefly how our hearing works. And there's another seminar that I do on, um, on, on stereo where I spend about an hour really getting into the fine detail about um, how our ears work. And I'm not going to do that this morning. Simply to say that um, this is a remarkable, remarkable gift that our Creator gave us. So, um, you know, the ear is classically divided into three parts. You've got the external ear consisting of the, the pinna, which of course holds up our glasses, microphones, and other hardware we might want to put on there. Um, there's the ear canal and the eardrum, three tiny little bones, this weird snail-shaped thing called the cochlea. And all of the parts of that um, uh, organ are, are incredibly complex and incredibly amazing. Um, a couple of things just to look at here. Those three little bones called the ossicles. You have the, uh, the, the hammer, the malleus, the, uh, the anvil, or, or um, I forget the Latin word for it, and the stapes, the sta uh, looks like a stirrup. And those bones would easily fit on, a, on an American dime. I mean, they're, they're the tiniest bones in your body. Um, and, you know, sort of how the ear works is, is, is a phenomenal thing to explore in the study. And, and when you do so, I think you come away with a respect for, for what the Creator gave us, but also a respect to understand that, man, I really got to protect this thing because it's, it's remarkably fragile. And yet, in its fragility, think of what the ear can do. The sensitivity of the ear to sound pressure, that's what we usually talk about in terms of loudness. It's seven units on a log scale, or about 10 million to one. The quietest sound we can hear and the loudest sound that we can hear right before it becomes pain, that ratio is 10 million to one in terms of pressure. I don't know about you, but 10 million is a pretty big number. The eye perceived wavelengths in less than an octave from about 400 nanometers to 700 nanometers. The ear, on the other hand, has a range of 10 octaves. And this is what makes audio and acoustics such a remarkably difficult field of engineering. We've got to deal with wavelengths that would not fit in this room. They're 17 meters long. And at the same time, with equal accuracy, deal with wavelengths that are that big at the same time in the same device. So what's a loudspeaker supposed to do then? Well, first thing, of course, it converts electricity into sound, right? So it's the other end of that chain that we think of. First we convert sound into electricity, then we process it, we crunch it, we amplify it, we manipulate it, we do all kinds of stuff, but at the end of the day 
we need a device that takes that electrical, electrical, <laughs> electrical signal and reconverts it back into sound so that we can hear it. Yeah? It should direct sound to where their ears. We talked about this before. That's what the speaker should do. It should say, go here, don't go there. And as we'll see this afternoon, if you stick around for the next presentation, um, speakers don't do that equally. Some speakers do it very, better, very much better than others. It should maintain fidelity over that wide range of um, frequencies that it has to deal with, which is no small feat. Remember, 17 meters and 17 millimeters, that's a thousand to one ratio that it has to maintain linearity over. Oh, good, it works. So, does the speaker matter? I've collected uh, five examples. Now, this is a little strange. Um, these five examples are recorded in a shootout at a church uh, in Indianapolis. And although it doesn't, the pictures don't really show it that I'm going to show, these five speakers were placed in an arc around a central location in the front of the church. And all I did was stuck a microphone at the center of that arc. Now, this particular shootout was done um, between five different manufacturers, but it was under the control of a completely independent consultant who had no vested interest in the outcome at all. His job was to make it fair, so he was the one who uh, set up, uh, we, we were asked to set up our speakers in a manner that we thought was best, we the manufacturers, but then the, the, the consultant took over from there, kept the levels absolutely equal, and all I did was record the whole event and then cut it into pieces. Okay, so I did no signal processing. You can believe me or not, I'm telling you the truth. <laughs> but what I want you to listen to is how much each loudspeaker energizes the room. Okay, so listen to the apparent reverberation in each of these recordings. Right? Here's loudspeaker A. Here's loudspeaker B. You hear how much room you can hear? Here's loudspeaker C. It's dark Loudspeaker D. Would give anything for you to shine down on. And finally, loudspeaker E. This feeling I'm trying to find. I hope you all heard a difference. Um, to my ears, the difference is not subtle. There was one loudspeaker where what you heard was pretty much the recording with no added reverberation. Yeah. And from my point of view, that loudspeaker was doing its job the way we want loudspeakers to behave. It was sending sound to where there's ears and not sending it everywhere in the room. When a loudspeaker cannot control where the sound goes, it goes everywhere. And the result of that, we, we, what we say in acoustics, is that's a, an apparent, in, it's an increase in the apparent reverberation. Obviously the room didn't change, it had a reverb time of about one and a half seconds. So the speaker didn't change the reverb time. What the speaker did is by adding sound to where there, <laughs> it shouldn't go, it increased the apparent reverberation time. 
So I think the answer is speakers do matter, and the choice of speakers does in fact matter. You see, some loudspeakers behave like this. And of course, the worst thing you could possibly do, in my opinion, is put an omnidirectional loudspeaker in a room like this. Because an omnidirectional loudspeaker, as you can see from this, not only sends sound everywhere, but of course, every one of these rays, of course, we know that sound doesn't behave like rays, but it's, it's close enough, creates reflections. And so if we kept this thing going, in, in less than a second, the screen would be black. I mean, there's so many reflections going around and so forth. So it, it really gets pretty crazy. That's not a very good approach. There are also people who like this approach. I don't particularly fall into that group <laughs> because I think these kinds of loudspeakers have their own issues. That's not what they wish they would do, but that's in, in fact what happens when you put multiple loudspeakers in the space. They all radiate independently and they create this sort of a mess. Another approach is to do something like this, where you've got a uh, control device, possibly a horn, that might have some directivity, but it's coupled with a woofer that has none. And so you have this kind of odd situation where some of the sound is being controlled, but a large portion of it is not. And that's, frankly, what we heard in those recordings earlier. Some loudspeakers were more like this. There is a th uh, another way, of course, and uh, it would be to have maybe something like a large horn, for example, that would control everything, the whole spectrum, uh, and not have, and not let that control go away until maybe the very lowest frequencies. So let's take a look at the next thing in our chain, and I'm going to just spend a few seconds on this. Um, I'm not particularly qualified to talk about mixers. I, I mean, I know how they work. I've used them, of course. Um, my field is, is acoustics, and, and now that I work for a speaker company, transducers. But just to say that there's really two choices, analog versus digital. In your lifetimes, you'll see analog go away completely, I suspect. Now it's still a, a reasonable choice, especially if you're a small church. You don't need the sophistication that a digital board brings. Um, remember, remember what I said earlier on today. <laughs> if the technology gets in the way of the message, it becomes the message. Um, too many times in my career at Danley, I've been sent out to fix loudspeakers that were obviously blown, only to find that in their digital mixer, somewhere in the levels of the layers of many menus deep, somebody had done a setting that everyone else forgot about, and of course the system sounded terrible, they blamed the speakers, and in one case I flew literally all the way across my country, which is a big one, to get to a place to replace the speakers on, uh, which were still under warranty, only to discover it was the digital mixer that, that was wrong. That could not happen in an analog. Just saying. I'm not suggesting that you scrap your digital mixers and buy analog, but I am suggesting pick a, a technology that's appropriate for your needs. And remember, if the technology gets in the way of the message, it in fact is the message. <laughs>